welcome uh, to this uh, QCWare Forge um, uh, webinar. Uh, QCWare Forge is all about doing data science on quantum computers. Thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, my name is Yanni Gambros. I'm head of business development for QCWare. And I'm joined today by Nihit uh, Pokrell, uh, Partner Solutions Architect at HPC. Uh, sorry, Partner Solutions Architect HPC at AWS. And uh, Fabio Sanchez, the Quantum Services Lead at QCWare. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody, for uh, joining us. We'll go over a few introductory slides about what Forge is uh, and what it can do, how it's differentiated, what is its value proposition. And then we'll jump into um, a demo um, uh, with uh, Fabio. And Nihid is also going to give us a quick overview of uh, essentially the Amazon Bracket service and what it can do. Uh, since actually Forge is uh, running on the Amazon Bracket service. Uh, so let's get into it. Uh, while we're going through all of this, you can use the, um, uh, the Q&A panel to ask questions. And uh, we should get to questions about uh, 30 minutes in, and we'll open it up for live Q&A at that point, basically. But you can essentially ask questions as we go through uh, the content. Okay, so uh, let's get started. Uh, so QCWare Forge is really all about uh, the algorithms. Uh, our team at QCWare is uh, building new, unique uh, NISC era algorithms. And we're putting basically all of those algorithms into Forge. We're doing a lot of research collaborations with enterprise customers. We're doing a lot of research collaborations with uh, hardware partners. And effectively, we're distilling all of that uh, know-how, all of that um, essentially new knowledge into our algorithmic library that goes straight into Forge. So, so that's the part that's essentially unique um, and performant about Forge and it's differentiated. However, we also wanted to create a full service. Uh, so it's easy for someone to come in and um, use these algorithms and actually execute on hardware. So what we've done is gone out and uh, looked at um, the quantum computing ecosystem and have partnered with the appropriate partners in order essentially to bring you this uh, full uh, integrated stack that also includes hardware access, which I just mentioned we get from these partners. So um, let's look at the two types of users that Forge is really built for. So on the one hand, we have the data scientists. And when we say data scientists, we're talking here about classically trained data scientists that actually have no uh, quantum computing background. And actually, uh, for most of them, they don't want to get into uh, the inner workings of quantum computing. They don't want to learn how to essentially build quantum circuits, how to design new quantum algorithms. For those, we're providing these turnkey algorithmic implementations of these quantum algorithms that we have discovered, right? So the typical uh, user flow that we have in mind for these data scientists is the typical user flow they would actually um, uh, follow during their classical workloads. So during kind of their classical day-to-day um, -day work, a data scientist essentially gets um, a data set, um, they explore it, they have some questions that they need to answer, and they say, okay, I need to essentially perform a classification to figure out who are the right customers, let's say, to uh, approach with a certain product or service. Um, so when they do that, they then um, start manipulating the data set, uh, pass it through a few different algorithms, and figure out what is the best algorithm that gives them the best accuracy, the best performance, right? So they don't really know anything about the inner workings of those algorithms. They just need good, reliable, performant uh, implementations of those algorithms. So that's exactly the kind of experience that we have in mind for this classically trained data scientist. So that's essentially our um, main or one of our two um, types of users that we're targeting with QCWare Forge. The second type of user are quantum engineers. So these are the users that actually have uh, intricate knowledge of quantum computing and want to build essentially new uh, quantum computing algorithms. And for those, what we can offer them are essentially circuit building blocks, right? So we're not just offering um, a simple uh, uh, environment to do editing and composition of new circuits 
Uh, there are many other uh, environments like that out there. What we're offering that's unique are some building blocks, some circuits, NISC circuits, that essentially they can reuse in their own work. And we're going to see examples of both of these two things today in the demo that we're going to show uh, in just a second. So um, today on Forge, these are the turnkey algorithms for data scientists. So we have algorithms for binary optimization and machine learning. And these are uh, the new capabilities that we're going to demonstrate today. So uh, linear algebra algorithms and implementations that do things like distance estimation and matrix multiplication. Obviously, these are pretty um, fundamental um, capabilities in terms of linear algebra capabilities, but um, they are required to build everything else essentially on top of, uh, on top of them. Uh, the other thing that we're going to demo today are these circuit building blocks for quantum engineers. Uh, again, these are the capabilities that exist on Forge today in terms of uh, utilities and other capabilities, standard capabilities like composing circuits, translation, simulation. The new thing that we're going to be demoing today are the data loading circuits that essentially we can provide as a building block, as a circuit that a quantum engineer can then take. Uh, load the real data set into uh, quantum states very efficiently uh, with very uh, short um, and efficient circuits. And then they can keep building uh, the rest of the circuit or their own algorithm after that. So um, Forge uh, actually has all the typical uh, data science platform features that you would expect. The key feature are these Jupyter notebooks where a user basically executes uh, all this experimentation. Uh, it's basically a sandbox environment, Python um, notebooks where um, they can call basically all these different libraries, all the existing features of Forge. They can install new packages and pretty much is a Python environment that they can do all the things um, that they can do on their local uh, Python environment. Um, and it also has some additional features that you would expect, like a getting started guide, um, what are the recent API calls that uh, someone executed, what are the different backends, hardware and simulation backends that are available, documentation, and so on and so forth, right? So we're just going to see during the demo today, uh, we're going to see Fabio basically executing uh, some of these calls on this standard, essentially, Jupyter Notebooks uh, feature. Now, these are the backends that are currently available on Forge. Um, so uh, a big set of these back backends is coming from Amazon Bracket and our integration with Amazon Bracket. That's D-Wave on the annealing side, INQ and Rigetti on the circuits. We also have a partnership with IBM. Uh, the partnership with IBM is a little bit different uh, from the other backends in the sense that the user actually needs to have IBM credentials and bring those credentials into Forge in order to connect to the IBM um, hardware that they have permissions from IBM to connect to. And we also provide some simulators, right? Let me show one more slide and then I'm going to pass it on to Nihit that can, that'll say a few more uh, words on, on Amazon. Uh, so this is the entire stack, right? So starting from the top where we have applications and algorithms to middleware, to platform as a service, to uh, hardware, right? So actually Forge implements this entire stack and a user can come in from the top, essentially go all the way down to any of the hardware um, uh, solutions uh, execute something, and we then bring back the result all the way to the top and present it to the user, right? Uh, but as I said earlier, really it's at the application and algorithms stack where we provide something that's very, very unique and very different from everything else that's out there in the market, right? So we provide this algorithmic implementations that we have discovered um, either through partners or, or in our own research. Everything else essentially that, come, that is outside this green box, essentially we get from uh, other partners that have implemented that into the ecosystem. Okay, so with that, let me pass it to uh, Nihit that's gonna essentially uh, discuss uh, very briefly Amazon Bracket. Thanks, Yanni, for the introduction and the overview of Forge. Um, I'm now going to talk about Amazon Bracket. 
Amazon Racket is AWS's fully managed quantum computing service that enables researchers and scientists to design, test, and run quantum algorithms in a technology agnostic programming environment. And um, Yanni, next please. And what I mean by that is that it is possible to run algorithms on actual quantum computers from multiple hardware providers built with different technologies. Amazon Bracket also allows to easily debug and test on high performance simulators that run on the same programming framework as the quantum devices themselves. And this is really helpful because this accelerates innovation as all you need to do is change one line of code to run your algorithm on any resource. Being able to run algorithms on different types of quantum hardware with Amazon Bracket means that you can directly compare technologies and assess which hardware is the best fit for your application. And all of this without having to commit to a single technology. You can also build and test hybrid algorithms that combine quantum hardware with classical computing resources that is available through Amazon Web Services. You can iterate and renovate, innovate faster. Now let us, um, next slide please, Yanni. Now let's look at the architecture of Amazon Bracket. Amazon Bracket works just like any other AWS service. Amazon Bracket provides on-demand quantum computing resource and you pay as you go. And that is without any upfront commitment. Amazon Bracket is well integrated with many AWS services, um, including Amazon CloudWatch, which is for monitoring and when the state of your task changes, you can send events to event bridge in almost real time. And what that means is you can configure alert notification, which will notify you via a message or an email when the task of the, when the task state changes. And the result of the quantum task can be stored in Amazon S3 in a JSON file format. Amazon Simple Storage Service, Amazon S3, is our storage service that is highly scalable and secure. You can also control permissions with identity and asset access management. Um, here you can create IAM users, group, and attach roles, and then determine who gets what access to Amazon Bracket. Um, another service that Amazon Bracket is really well integrated with is AWS CloudTrail. CloudTrail provides a record of actions taken by any user or role or a service within Bracket. And another thing that I wanted to highlight was the ability to tag resources. You can also tag resources in Amazon Bracket. Um, and what tagging allows you to do is that uh, once you activate tags, you can use them on the cost allocation management dashboard to see how much Amazon Bracket you're using. And at the end of a month, you get a report that says these tags, um, these, these services cost you that much amount. Um, so to get started with Amazon Bracket, um, it comes with example notebooks, tutorials, and tools such as fully managed Jupyter notebooks, which you can use without the need to set up and manage any infrastructure. You can also install the Bracket SDK and work in your local development environment. You can also directly use the AWS Management Console. From the console, you can control the task and check the hardware availability directly. Now let's talk about the hardwares that is available through Amazon Bracket. Through Amazon Bracket, you have access to both simulators and actual quantum computers. You can use the managed simulator. Currently, we offer three of them besides the local simulator, state vector simulator, SV1, tensor network simulator, TN1, and density matrix simulator, DM1. The local simulator is for rapid prototyping and testing and runs in your local environment. You do not need to specify any S3 location. Um, and the simulator is included in Amazon Bracket SDK at no cost. SV1 is our general purpose simulator, which is based on state vector technology. It provides predictable execution and high performance for universal circuits up to 34 qubits. TN1, 
um, is a specialized simulator for sparse circuits and circuits with local gates and other circuits that have structure. DM1 is especially designed to support noise modeling. If you need to study your algorithms under the effect of various types of noise, we recommend using D1. These simulators allow you to debug and test your code before running it in the quantum hardware. You really only need to choose the right simulator for your task and will size the infrastructure dynamically for you. Once you're ready, you can execute your circuit by changing one line of code. Um, Amazon Bracket provides access to both annealing and gate-based quantum computers. Um, as we heard from Yanni before, following the gate-based quantum computing paradigm, you can access trapped ion technology from INQ, superconducting quantum computers from Rigetti, or you can also solve quantum annealing problems using the latest QPUs from D-Way. This helps you test different technologies and compare the compute performance of different machines for the problem that you're trying to solve. And you can choose the hardware system that is best suited for your application. In the fullness of time, Amazon Bracket will continue to add more quantum computing platform and technology and make it available to our customers. With all these resources available to you, you're ready to actually experiment with quantum computing on Bracket. QCWare's Forge, built on Bracket, can help you speed up your research by providing quantum algorithms for binary optimization, linear algebra, and machine learning. QCWare is an AWS partner and provides users with performance algorithms across industries such as financial service, automotive, energy, and pharmaceutical. Um, with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Fabio for a deeper dive into Forge and its linear algebra capabilities. Over to you, Fabio. Uh, thank you, Nihit. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Fabio Sanchez, um, and I'm going to start by um, discussing and showing you a little bit more about our linear algebra functionality for data scientists. Um, go ahead, Yanni. So... Um, for, for a lot of users who are familiar or who are used to doing uh, any sort of linear algebra computation as part of their analysis, uh, they're probably familiar or already use tools like NumPy and PyTorch. Uh, so the idea here is that uh, we have built um, and are going to continue to build functionality that essentially gives you a speed up, at least under certain circumstances, for a lot of the core features present in these two libraries that are used as part of a lot of, uh, a lot of algorithm, algorithms or analyses that are done by um, data scientists. So we've built it to mirror um, you know, NumPy and PyTorch in a very straightforward way. And what I want to show you today is the Q dot functionality for matrix multiplication and the distance estimation functionality, which gives you the square Euclidean distance between two vectors. Uh, go ahead, Yanni. So uh, why, why did we build this? Well, so we've essentially uh, you know, developed algorithms, quantum algorithms that speed up these computations as compared to the classical, um, the, the equivalent classical algorithms. So what do we mean by this speed up? Well, what we're computing here is the, fun, the number of fundamental steps needed to perform a certain computation. And because quantum computers allow for a different type of fundamental operations, then you can actually perform certain tasks, including this one, in fewer steps. Now, the speed up will really only kick in for high dimensional vectors. So here we have two examples comparing the number of steps needed for um, you know, for two different dimensions. And as the dimension gets higher, the speed up becomes more significant. Of course, I'm not including here any considerations about uh, the actual hardware that's being run on. For, so, so I'm not taking into account clock speed for the processors. But the thing that I want to emphasize here is actually that these linear algebra operations are actually really fundamental for to build, you know, a lot of different and more complex algorithms. So it's kind of a starting point to build um, performant quantum algorithms is to build these performant quantum subroutines that will be used as part of a bigger algorithmic workflow. Uh, so next slide. 
So now I'm actually going to, to show you um, these tools on Forge. So what I'm going to show you is essentially just some kind of standardized data. I'm going to generate random data here. Uh, I'm going to show you both QDOT and distance estimation on that data. And you know, you'll see how, um, how everything comes out. So I'm going to share my screen now. So this is um, you know, the Forge hosted Jupyter Notebooks environment. Um, anyone can you know, go on forge.qcware.com and sign up for a free trial. So the first thing I'm going to do is create two, um, two vectors. You can see that these vectors are actually orthogonal. And what I'm going to do is use, instead of numpy dot, I'm going to use QCWare's Q dot to compute the inner product between them. And as you can see, it should be zero. And you can see that we effectively get zero here as well. Uh, so now let's do that with a uh, larger vector. So I'm going to generate random 100 dimensional vectors and then compute the, uh, the dot product using the standard numpy dot functionality and then uh, the QCWare Q dot. Let's go ahead and do that. And as you can see, you get the same answer for both of these. We can also use Q dot to perform matrix multiplication. So I'm going to do the same thing here with random four by four matrices. And you can actually compare that these two matrices are identical. One was obtained using numpy dot. The other one is um, QCWare's Q dot. So, you know, underneath the hood, we have a quantum algorithm. So it's like actual quantum circuit that's running to compute these, uh, these inner products. Now, of course, uh, everything I've shown you so far has been running on a simulator. So, uh, and, you know, as a lot of you are already familiar, right? Quantum hardware right now is in its primitive stages. There's a lot of noise, but we do, uh, you know, through our partners, um, including AWS, we do allow um, you to run on real hardware. So uh, to run, you know, any of our functionality on real hardware, you could actually simply change the backend for example, in this case, we could run it on IonQ. Just choose a backend to be AWS bracket slash IonQ, and you know something that something else that you'll need to pass, of course, is the number of measurements, which is just the number of samples that you want to get from um, the quantum computer. And you could, you know, kind of seamlessly uh, submit this. Uh, of course, it takes a little bit of a little while because of queuing times and so on. So I'm not going to do that now, but you know, you can all check this out for yourself later. So what about distance estimation? Well, distance estimation is going to work in a very similar way. Here I'm, going, I'm creating two NumPy arrays. The distance between them is four, and I'm going to compute the distance, you know, use QCWare's distance estimation technique to, to perform that estimation. And as I mentioned, the distance estimation functionality outputs the square of the Euclidean distance. So, you know, of course, 16 is four squared. We can do this for, you know, generic vectors. Here I'm generating, I'm going to generate two random five dimensional vectors and compute the square distance. I'm also comparing it to NumPy square distance, which of course it matches it. Again, everything so far has been running on a simulator. As I mentioned, you know, we can run distance estimation on any backend that we make available simply by choosing the appropriate backend, which you can also find on the left here under the backends tab. Uh, we also have uh, the ability to perform distance estimation with a batch of vectors. Uh, you know, if you're familiar with Torch, then this is something that is routinely done. Uh, and so here I'm just showing you um, how to compute um, distance estimation between a batch of two vectors, and you can do this, you know, more generally as well. Okay, thanks, Fabio. So this was the um, yeah. Um, go ahead with the data loader circuits, please. Yeah. So the next tool I, I want to show you is uh, for actually for quantum engineers. So these are going to be the people who actually want to create quantum circuits and you know create their own algorithms and simulate them directly and so on. So the functionality that I want to highlight is the data loader circuits. So go ahead to the next slide. Okay, so what are data, data loaders? Well, anytime you're doing, um, anytime you want to do quantum machine learning, uh, you need your quantum computer to have essentially quantum access to the data that you want to analyze. But your data is classical, so that needs to be essentially loaded on 
to a quantum state, which is part of the quantum circuit, um, in in a certain way, and that's what the data loaders are for. So doing that, you know, loading process of the data onto the quantum circuit can be uh, can can cost you know precious kind of circuit depth and qubits. So for a visual comparison here, um, we, we I want to highlight uh, how QCWare's data loader circuits are 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 different. So you know. Here's a, a picture, which is only 10 by 10, so 100 pixels. This is something that, you know, on not on current hardware, but potentially in a few generations, one would be able to load using kind of standard loading techniques. Now, what QCWare has developed are kind of flexible data loaders that allow you to essentially load more data um, by trading off kind of circuit depth to number of qubits. So using uh, one of Forge's data loaders, one could in principle, load a 1000 pixel image versus a 100 pixel image on the same number of qubits. Um, and then of course, this is still ways away from you know, things that can be done right now classically, um, but it's certainly a step that's needed in order for quantum machine learning to become relevant and competitive um, against current classical machine learning algorithms. So let's move on. Uh, okay, so a lot of um, a lot of our users and clients have asked us about the complexity comparison between our data loaders and you know other loading techniques, and you know here here's the the summary table of course, um, and I want to one thing that I want to emphasize is kind of the flexibility between uh, our loaders right there is a trade off um, that between circuit depth and number of qubits which kind of allows you to adapt depending on how quantum hardware progresses over the next few years. Um, so uh, I'm going to show you both the parallel data loader and the optimized data loader. Uh, and here are the, you know, the parallel data loader scales linearly in the number of qubits, but has logarithmic depth. And the parallel data loader, sorry, the optimized data loader scales like the square root with the number of data points that you want to load. Um, with depth also going like the square root. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, and so here's, you know, kind of a simplified version of that, which is just showing for a particular n, in this case 1000, what the qubit count and depth required for the circuits to perform the data loading portion of the 1000 dimensional vector. Okay, we can move on. Okay, and then uh, also for those of you who want more uh, technical information, this is all uh, part of this paper that came out in uh, December of last year, I believe. Uh, and, you know, where we use the data loaders to perform certain classification tasks on real quantum hardware. In this case, it was IonQ's um, trapped ion quantum computer. Uh, so, you know, Feel free, and there's, we use like standard benchmarks there. So feel free to like look at the paper to, to, to get more information. Okay. Uh, okay, so now I want to actually show you how this works on Forge. So as I mentioned, you know, you can just bring any data set and then Forge will let you create a, the quantum circuit that performs the loading technique. And then uh, you can use that circuit to like build your own algorithm. You can execute it. And, and that's what I'm going to show you today. So I'm going to generate and then normalize um, some four-dimensional data in this case. So this is what it looks like. Um, the normalization part is of course necessary because of how quantum states work. Uh, so uh, now to create the data loader, it's as simple as calling qio.loader from our forge libraries. And this is what it looks like. In this case, I chose the parallel data loader that I mentioned before, which has you know more qubits but a shorter depth. And now let's um, actually simulate this circuit. And uh, remember that I, I used this data to load it into a quantum state encoded by this circuit on four qubits. So I'm going to simulate this circuit and print the state vector. And of course, the data is four-dimensional the space of states for four qubits is actually 16 dimensional. So we're really only using a four dimensional subspace here, but we can actually compare that the numbers that I generated up here are indeed part of the uh, you know, state vector down here. 
Uh, as I mentioned, you can also uh, change the type of data loader. So for comparison here, I'm going to create two separate loaders, the parallel one that you just saw and the optimized one. And in this case, I'm using five dimensional data. Um, and then let me go ahead and print those. And this is what they look like. So the parallel data loader is going to use more qubits. The optimized data loader uses fewer qubits, but at a cost of a greater depth. And again, as with anything, you can you can you know quickly execute these on real quantum hardware simply by choosing the appropriate backend. You know this is all of course detailed in our documentation. Uh, if you have uh, any more questions, thank you very much. So um, and I see a lot of questions are coming in. We're going to get to those in in just a second here. I just wanted to mention that um, there are two uh, interesting features coming up uh, that we'd like to share here in our roadmap. Um, so uh, one of the key things actually that we've done, uh, we've partnered with uh, large financial institutions and looked at how um, uh, how we can essentially build uh, Monte Carlo, how, how we can do Monte Carlo simulation in a shallow way on NISC devices. Uh, so please look out for that uh, to come up in, in Forge actually very, very soon. And the other thing is related to what we just showed, right? So we showed these linear algebra features, the distance estimation feature and the matrix multiplication feature. We basically showed just the result, right? Uh, we, um, we showed it as a, essentially like a turnkey solution for, for the data scientists. But what we're planning on doing is essentially exposing the circuits as building blocks so that it's available also for the quantum engineers um, to take essentially those circuits and um, keep using them for building essentially bigger and better and different algorithms, right? Uh, so with that, let me also very quickly say that uh, you can try out Forge uh, for free today. Uh, you can go to forge.qcware.com um, and you can sign up. Uh, you don't need any special, uh, there's no special process. You just click the sign up button, basically provide credentials, and then you're on the platform. And what you get when you sign up, effectively, you get this developer plan um, where we are happy to provide uh, potentially for a limited time, um, this unlimited CPU uh, simulation time. Uh, so this is our very own uh, CPU simulator. And uh, so you can essentially use uh, that simulation time, use the different features and um, essentially experiment with the different parts of the algorithm, uh, essentially for free. We also give a very limited amount of hardware and GPU time to you for free uh, to get started. So you can try out a few calls on the GPU, you can try out a few calls on the hardware. Uh, and so effectively uh, you, can, you can experience pretty much most of the platform for free. And um, uh, and as it says there, it's basically just a one user seat plan, right? And once you're happy with that, you're you're looking forward to run bigger things on hardware or bigger things on uh, the GPU, or basically want to have a more uh, a bigger team on on the platform, then you can essentially uh, migrate to an enterprise plan, which also has unlimited CPU time, and then it has a specific. Uh, limits, uh, bigger limits on hardware and GPU time, and then can also um, offer, we also offer essentially multiple user seats uh, on those plans. So, so there's like the typical small, medium, large, and pay-as-you-go plans um, on, on the enterprise side. Okay, so with that, let me stop sharing and let's look at what um, kind of questions came in and what we can answer here. QDOP calls out to a remote server, is this a local simulator? Well, so uh, it, everything is done on our server. So it's, this is just an API. Um, and, you, you know, regardless if you're choosing simulation or a hardware backend, every computation is done on our server. So it does call out to a remote server. Um, of course, uh, when you get the full quantum circuits, you know, for the functionality that has the output to that gives you the circuit, then you could simulate that locally. But uh, everything else on Forge uh, is done on our servers. What's the largest array we can use on the backend? Well, that varies a lot. So the, the I think that it's easier to think about the answer, you know, how many qubits you can use, right? So the number of qubits limits the, you know, the, the the largest array that you can perform a computation on. 
So in the case of IMQ, we have 11 qubits. So in principle, you could perform computations using the you know optimized um, data loader on uh, you know an n that's larger than 11. But of course, then when you're using real hardware, the noise comes into play as well. So if your computation is sufficiently large, you know you'll get noisy results. Regardless, even if you have a short computation, noise is still there. So you'll need to kind of post-process your results. Uh, in terms of simulation, uh, we can simulate up to you know 26 qubits um, that we allocate right now. You know the simulators that we have on Forge, we can allocate up to, to that much. But of course, at 26 qubits, a full state vector simulation starts to be you know pretty computationally intensive. Do your tools work differently when submitting to a QC like IronQ and an Eric wave Does the user need to change anything in the code or the problem formulation? How would a circuit-based computational problem be embedded on the G wave any other? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, the, the short answer is that not everything that can be done on a circuit model machine can be done on D wave, right? So Q dot and distance estimation and data loaders don't work on D wave. D wave is you know, D-Wave's quantum annealer is only there for binary optimization problems. We didn't showcase today our uh, our functionality related to optimization, but we have done so in the past. The video from Q to B, for example, does that. Um, so if you want to, uh, you know, you can watch that video. Also, it's in our documentation, but, you know, when you're, when you're solving a problem on D-Wave, then presumably that's an optimization problem. So then, you know, if you're using our binary optimization functionality, then you can easily transition between submitting it to D-Wave or doing QAOA on the circuit model machine. However, how many qubits are needed for Q dot uh, for N by N? Again, um, it depends on the loader, right? So, so if you go back to the, to, the, to the slide that I showed earlier, where you have, um, where you have like the two different loaders. One of them is like parallel and uses however many data points is that many qubits. Um, the uh, optimized one, however many data points you have, it's roughly square root number of qubits. At the start, there's a little bit of an overhead, but that's the scaling. Um, one way to try it out actually is to just get the loader circuits that we showed you and you know try to input the data that in whatever data set you want, create the circuit and you can, you know, quickly see however many qubits it has. That's because, you know, just based on the structure of the circuits, sometimes you need to round to the nearest power of two. Um, okay, the precision of the multiplication, that's, um, it's a little bit subtle um, because the precision is going to be limited by your readout um which is set by your number of samples uh it, so it, so <laughs> it, on a real of course on a simulator the precision is just the same precision as your computer is doing the simulation right because that's just keeping track of the full state vector now on real quantum hardware the precision is just strictly limited by uh, the number of samples that you get from the quantum computer. So if you get more samples, you get more precision. Is there any API to collect the circuit execution times when running circuits on hardware? I actually think that maybe this is a question for the AWS side. Um, maybe, maybe I also misunderstood the question. Um, so when we, on our side, whenever you submit something to any backend, we keep track of the uh, execution time, both on the hardware, quantum hardware and classical uh, portions. Classical portions are priced one way uh, and then quantum hardware of course is more expensive. And, you know, we, we use, a, you know, we have our internal QCT, that's how you're charged for, for that. Um, and of course, you know, we appropriately rescale whatever is done classically is of course, you know, charged way less than what's done on a, on the, on the quantum, an actual quantum hardware. But I don't know if he wants to say anything about a, uh, AWS uh, uh, on the quantum hardware side. Actually, um, Fabio, I do not have an answer to that question. Um, okay. 
I'll have to I'll have to look that up. Okay, no problem. What is the real performance advantage near term and future? Um, well, near term, we okay. The, the, the performance advantage on Q, things like Q dot and distance estimation is that the number of steps that you need to perform that computation is grows logarithmically, uh, as compared to linearly, essentially for uh, for for that operation to be done uh, classically versus on the quantum computer. Now, okay, that's not really saying like the real advantage because that depends on quantum hardware. So right now, and then for the next few generations, I personally do not foresee there being any advantage for doing the computation in on a quantum computer. Now, as quantum hardware matures, and you know, presumably we're going to use these routines on as a part of a larger algorithm, then uh, the, maybe the the full computation on a better quantum computer that uh, where, where classical computers are kind of struggling, then there should be an advantage. So that really is going to depend on quantum hardware and on the actual use case. Because if, you're, if, the, if whatever you're doing is very, very fast on a classical computer, like if your laptop can do that in a second without any problems, then there's probably no reason to use a quantum computer in the next decade just because you need to connect to the quantum computer you need to like run the circuits collect samples that's going to take time even on a very very fast clock uh, clock speed quantum computer so fabio let me also highlight something here so yeah everything fabio said is correct i just want to highlight that um, and the answer is actually goes cuts straight to the point right so uh which is when are we going to get there right when are we going to really get to uh to quantum advantage so really the big constraining factor is hardware right now and uh if we look at the roadmaps that um hardware vendors have publicized and assuming they can stick to the roadmaps, right? So IBM, Google, IonQ, and, and whoever else really publicized roadmap, um, they kind of make the point that in maybe three years, we'll have a thousand qubits, right? And th so the question is whether your problem, first of all, can be solved on a thousand qubits, uh, whether we're gonna have those thousand qubits and whether your problem right now, uh, as Fabio said, really takes so long uh, to solve classically this problem that can fit on a thousand qubits really takes so long classically that um you basically can't can't really um deal with that from a business perspective and you need an answer much much faster right so when all of these conditions are met um we can expect that maybe maybe the answer is yes in, in three years time if all these conditions are met you have a large problem that can fit on a thousand qubits and Classically, uh, you cannot solve this problem in a reasonable amount of time for for the business case, basically. Uh, so obviously, there's a lot of fifth statements there and a lot of disclaimers. So we definitely realize that we don't want to make any you know uh, statements that um, add to the hype or anything like that. Um, so it's basically that's kind of the situation where the entire community uh, is in right now. What's the complexity of the classical algorithm that generates the data loader circuit? Uh, that's a that's a great question. Um, so so it's essentially the number of gates, the number of steps that you need to do classically to generate the circuit is the number of gates that you need to input. So that scales like n log n for the data loader circuit. Um, it's not, I mean, it's a little bit trickier because I mean, you can, you might be able to do a little bit better than that, but that's roughly, uh, roughly the, roughly what to have in mind because when you're building the circuit you actually need to you know create an object that stores every single gate so so that's that's i think the ballpark that you want to have in mind is are we working on any linear solvers um i mean yes we're working on a lot of quantum algorithms we focus on ones where we think that there's more prospects for the near term we certainly uh are looking into linear solvers and making them more uh, near term because the you know, current solutions are, are do not really run on near term devices. So so the short answer is yes, but I, there's no like roadmap item right now for linear solvers because we'd only add them if we can add something uh, something value I guess more valuable than like what HHL already does. 
So, so yeah, so, so this is, uh, this is accurate. And let me also highlight that, you know, it's almost like you need to, um, um, cover a lot of steps before you get to linear solvers, right? So, and, and that's kind of what we're doing here, right? So you need to get data on to the quantum state sufficiently, then you need to be able to execute certain, you know, linear functions uh, efficiently, like matrix multi, uh, manipulations, right? And, and then you can get to the point where you can have things like, you know, the full linear solver and, and solve basically like a kind of standard um, LP problem, right? So, um, so it's a, you know, it takes it takes a few steps before we can get there. And as you see, basically, we're just kind of covered the first few steps uh, in that journey. As we can submit the same job to multiple backends. Yeah, that's right. I mean, if so long as you have a, a one of the four JPI calls, then you can just change the backend parameter. It, it will go to whatever backends that, that you write. Can we implement quantum reinforcement learning and simulator quantum hardware? Well, you can mean a lot of things for quantum reinforcement learning. We've been looking at it from multiple angles um as it's still like a re r d phase um we have engagements with customers that for which we've looked at it um the short answer is yes only you know simulators is what makes sense for that uh a full uh of you know if you want your full policy to be a quantum circuit that's you know much much harder because you're going to presumably need a you know deeper quantum circuit with more qubits uh, so, so things like that are not really promising in the near term, but you know, it's certainly doable. It's, it's an active area of research. We've, we've also looked at it. Um, it's hard to answer, um, much more than that, unless we have more specific questions. Uh, you talked about precision, but I'm curious about scale. Will quantum computer be able to do anything that looks like floating point arithmetic or it look like more like fixed point arithmetic? Um, it can't, so, you know, a quantum computer can in principle do all the operations that a classical computer can. The question is like, can they do it faster or, or, and, or is that operation kind of needed for like a quantum algorithm that does something faster? So if the, if there's no complexity advantage for the quantum operation, and if it's not part of another task, then it wouldn't make sense to do it on a quantum computer uh, for a long time until until they become just, you know, as good as classical computers, which who knows when that will happen or if. Um, but, uh, but yeah, in principle, they can, you know, those, you know, the, the basic gates for doing so have all been figured out. Um, it's not very difficult to do that. Um, so it's just a question of, uh, are these important operations and there's for for different quantum algorithms. And to answer that question for near term algorithms, the, the answer is they're not for the most part. So that's why they're not really talked about. And that's all it's also related because you know there that those operations are like cost gates, and each gate that you put at that you put in adds errors to your quantum computation. What metrics is this for support for assessing the quality of results, fidelity of your accuracy, correction, violations of decoherence, constraint or deeper state? Okay, um, right now we don't really offer any uh, metrics that are telling you that your result, that, they, that your errors on the quantum hardware is sufficiently high. Uh, or like that essentially we don't really do any circuit analysis to kind of tell you ahead of time what the limitations are. Now you can compare your results to simulation. Anything you can do right now, you can simulate too. So you can do that analysis yourself on Forge, but we don't have any tools at the moment that assesses that performance. Is there any quantum algorithm available for graph data for... Um, there are lots of quantum algorithms for graphical problems that I'll answer it like that. Um, we, we have to get way more specific. Uh, and it really depends on the particular, you know, algorithm that you're interested in to have a, to t discuss a specific quantum algorithm for that. Could you please explain why the number of qubits we have to is the square root and the minimum number? Okay, uh, the reason so that's yeah, you're right, right? So if you have n qubits, then the space, the the you know, the Hilbert space is two to the n dimensional. So in principle, you could store two to the n numbers on there. But the reason why we, we have square root n or even just n is because you can make way shorter circuits 
by using more qubits. And that's going to be more relevant in the near term where it seems that like the limitation is mainly the circuit depth for the, for, you know, the limit because of errors. So it's definitely true that, um, that, that you can use log n qubits and encode the data and that that's already been figured out. We, the square root n is kind of a new loader that is kind of, that, that trades off having still square root n times log n depth and you know fits square root n number of, sorry it fits n points in square root of n qubits. How do we manage our spending? Do we know how much QPU time we use at all time? That so we store every API call um, and you can look in uh, in Forge on under API what the duration of that call is and that's essentially how much how much costs you in in our in like QCT which is like the Forge currency. How practical is loader square root n for actual implementation? Um, well, right now it's more practical than an implementation in log n qubits because uh, that be because the circuit depth would be too high. So for current devices, it's very practical uh, compared to like, of course, nothing is beating anything we do classically. So I think we have to wait and see that like, we just have to wait and see which which loading technique makes sense to analyze to analyze data as, like, as hardware becomes more mature. Yeah, thank you all so much. Uh, this was a great, uh, great set of questions. Um, so uh, we'll, be, um, we'll be posting the recording on our YouTube channel. Uh, please check that out. Please check uh, forge.qsewear.com uh, and Amazon Bracket, if you will. And uh, if you have more questions, please reach out to, uh, to us. Uh, please reach out to support at uh, uh, qsewear.com. And uh, we'll be happy to, uh, to answer and uh, take any more questions. Thank you very much.